Welcome to the Interrupted Podcast. We are here to cut through the noise of life to give you the tools and knowledge you need to relentlessly pursue a life of truth, integrity, discipline, and adventure. Consider this day interrupted. Welcome to the Interrupted Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Hallman, and it is good to be with you this week. I hope you have had a chance to dive into the episodes that we've released, and it's hard to believe here we are with episode 13 being released. It's been an awesome journey, and uh, I continue to be blown away by the positive contact, positive feedback I'm having from all the episodes. I'm grateful for the guests that have come on the show, and I hope you've received a great deal of benefit and value from the perspectives that the guests have been sharing. Let me just take a moment to encourage you to think about an interruption when you wake up in the morning. Do you ever say to yourself, interrupt me? Well, that is what I am trying to get you to do with the interrupted podcast. I want you to have the tools I want you to be able to mitigate interruptions by having a perspective that allows you to step back, detach just for a moment, understand that when an interruption happens, and it likely will each day, whether that is your child interrupting you, getting bad news from someone, or something that is just very disruptive to your thought process and causes you to have negative emotions. The goal here of the conversations that we're bringing you is that you will hear the stories of others that have gone before and have walked through some pretty troubling adversity. And when they're able to be separated from that adversity, they're able to have a perspective that lends itself to teaching others and that it stands to be instructional as to how we all should act when things happen rather than just be overcome by the emotional weight that comes with challenging situations. On the show, we're covering a variety of different topics, but my hope at the end of the day is that you are better equipped, you have a positive perspective on life, and you're able to go out and crush your career goals. You're able to experience a thriving marriage, exciting uh, parenting, go deeper into relationships than maybe what you would have thought of before because of your ability to set your ego aside and to diminish that inclination that everything Uh, revolves around me. As a human, that's a very uh, easy trap to fall into, and we just want to minimize that or mitigate uh, these interruptions that do happen in your life. And so I hope that as we go through more conversations and have these incredible guests on the show, you'll uh, gain a greater perspective and be able to do that. Today, I am excited to bring you this conversation with Dennis Velope. He is a really cool, authentic guy that I got to know through a friend, actually. He connected us, said we might be uh, wanting to sit down and, and have a conversation, and man, he was right. I'm really blown away by this opportunity to speak with Dennis and just the amount of experience that he can bring to the table and hopefully help you maybe rethink a situation that you've been in in the past and better prepare you for the situations and interruptions that you're going to face in the future. We never know when an interruption or a transition, uh, different things in life may be coming upon us. Uh, And the better we can prepare now for those, by equipping ourselves with knowledge and information that experts have and humbly listening to those individuals and deciding 
whether or not to apply some of these tactics that they're teaching us is a great position to be in. So in our conversation, you will definitely hear how Dennis goes into some of these strategies that I hope will help you. I want to take just a moment to read over some just excerpts from Dennis's bio, uh, just to help you understand a little bit about him and, and some of the experiences he's had, although during the show we're going to go in much greater detail. But he is a principal leadership development consultant and executive coach with the Leadership Research Institute, and they specialize in leadership and organizational development, career and transition coaching, emotional intelligence and resilience, and personal leadership for emerging leaders and mid-level and upper-level executives. So they do a lot uh, in that space dealing with uh, really high-performing people and people that just want to be better. His successes occur by challenging and empowering leaders to embrace a current reality and define a desired end state and equipping people with the tools and resources and a perspective necessary to be successful in new and challenging environments. I'm going to let Dennis himself share the rest about his career and some of the things that he's involved in. So without further ado, let's get right into the show and I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dennis Velopi. Dennis, thanks for joining me on the podcast. It's good to have you, brother. Yeah, Stephen, thanks. Uh, thanks for you know having me. I've been uh, looking forward to this uh, for a bit. After we chatted, uh, yeah, I was. It was uh, it was an energize energizing conversation. So I was super excited to have the opportunity to chat with you here. That's that's good feedback. Yeah, it's it's interesting how uh, you know everything aligned and uh, we we got connected. You know, through a mutual friend. It's it's. It's been interesting with this space with podcasting and just the different ways of connecting with people and engaging with people and you know uh, even though we're at states apart uh, we're able to uh, connect and, and hear a little bit more about your story I'm, I'm very excited for this conversation I think it's going to be really powerful for our audience and uh, the, the whole idea is we help uh, folks get a new perspective maybe on what their situation is at because I mean the human experience while it's so uh, extremely unique there's just a common thread that you constantly see and if we can help people understand that they're not alone uh, in their everyday battles and everyday fights to have the life they want that's you know that's what we're trying to do here and and so far in the conversations we've been able to bring people here in the spring of 2020 I think it's done that in our lead up conversation uh did not disappoint for, for me as well. I've been excited as well. So I, I appreciate that feedback that, that you gave. Yeah, absolutely. So what, b before we get into it too much, what's, what's the spring been like with uh, all the lockdown and different procedures? How has, how has life changed and how have you adapted if we uh, talk about current events here before we dive a little further back? Sure. The, uh, you know, the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic uh, has been interesting. And I think uh, interesting is the right word because, and I think it encompasses what we're going to talk about, is crisis provides opportunity. And when I think about the opportunities it's provided me from a personal perspective, it was an opportunity to reflect on what's important uh, to what I wanted to prioritize. It allowed me to explore different options in terms of what I wanted to do and how I wanted to do it. Uh, it allowed me to uh, the opportunity to connect with people I haven't connected with and in, in a bit to truly, uh, you know, focus on relationships and the people that matter and uh, realizing that uh, I allowed life to get in the way a little bit. And, uh, and then the last thing was just, you know what, take, take action, do something about all the things that you wanted to do. I remember reading somewhere that, you know, if you don't come out of this pandemic, either with, an, you know, having done something significant for yourself or others, started, a, you know, a side hustle, learned mm -hmm. a, uh, you know, a new, new hobby, or made a new connection or relationship, you wasted the opportunity. And I've, yeah. I've tried to take advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. How many times do we hear people say, man, I'm so busy. I wish I had more time. I wish I could do this. Uh, you know, my, my, my list of things keeps building up and whatever that is. And here you go. You've been handed it. And I think there'll be some reflection here as we start to move beyond this, as people uh, just reflect on this time and say, well, I either use that time well or 
uh, I would like some of that some of that time back because I would do it differently, and uh, yeah. that that will be an an interesting perspective as well. And uh, when when I you know I've been talking to a lot of people because I I'm in the uh, leadership development and executive coaching space about you know, if you reflect on this time, you know what are the things that you want to bring forward? What do you want to throw in your backpack? You know your life backpack that mm-hmm. then continue to take on your journey, but also what are the things that were in your pack before that you realize you don't need Yeah, and really put your pack down on the ground, look inside it and say, yeah, you know what, this, this, and this really don't need it. Get rid of it. So that way you can get out of this whole thing, more energized, more focused and more, and, and more ready for action. Yeah, absolutely. Would you give us uh, just maybe a, a thirty thousand foot overview of kind of of what you're doing now, and then I'd like to just take a a, a pause from that and go back because I think that's going to help set up um, your story and and the and your family of origin and things that have brought you to where you are. So if could you briefly just, you, I know you said briefly there that you were just talking about you're in the, the coaching leadership space just kind of set us up for uh, where you're at now so we can uh, understand the journey a little more. Sure. Um, right now I'm a principal uh, leadership development consultant and uh, executive performance and transition coach with the Leadership Research Institute. So and my primary focus areas are in emotional intelligence, uh, personal and organizational resilience, uh, team effectiveness and decision-making. So I get to work with uh, organizations, teams, and individuals. And uh, I look to enlighten, empower, and equip individuals and teams to do what they want to do and uh, get to where they want to go as efficiently and effectively as possible. Right on, right on. Well, I I mean, I imagine that manifests itself in so many different ways. And in order to do those things um, well, I think a lot of that has, I'm sure you draw upon prior experiences heavily in that. I believe, you know, we can learn tactics and good questioning and and ways to guide people through maybe education, but uh, personal experience, I think, plays a huge role in that space. Would that be accurate? Yeah, I think, Stephen, I think you hit on it. There's, I think there's a combination of the two. Right, you have to have that experience, and then you have to prepare yourself um, with education and training, so you could be the best instrument of change for others. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I did one of the things I did uh, to do that was I went through the Columbia University Executive Coaching Program, and okay. I like to say that provided me with. Uh, with some frameworks to, to think about so that way you can really have powerful coaching conversations with either individuals or teams to get them to where they want to go. Awesome. Man, that's phenomenal. Well, this is where you're at now, but there was a, a big lead up called life before you arrived at this moment where you're able to be impactful um, in the lives of others. So would you just take us back through a little bit, um, going all the way back to maybe your family of origin, where you grew up, um, what what put you on the trajectory to um, go uh, in, into the military and then transition out of the military? Just uh, share with us a little bit about your story. And if you would, if you could pick out even a, a moment of uh, or a person of, of influence or that was really provided some of that leadership and mentorship. I mean, that can be obviously multiple people in this situation, but I think it's it's important to stop and pause and express some gratitude towards uh, those people that uh, were with you and guided you on the way as well. So if, if you just go back and, and walk us through a little bit of your story. Sure, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a simple kid, uh, you know, Long Island. Island kid, and uh, so grew up on uh, on Long Island, and um, you know I'm the son of a Vietnam era um, infantry marine turned police officer. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, I have an f- entire family of uh, military folks. You know, I uh, my I had a obviously my father was in Vietnam. I had an uncle who who was in the Marine Corps in Vietnam. I had a, another uncle who was in the Navy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
Uh, both of my grandfathers were in World War II. Um, one was in the Pacific, one was in the European theater. And I even had, uh, you know, a great uncle who was a Marine at uh, Guadalcanal. So uh, in terms of military history and, and commitment to service to our nation, uh, that was something that was, in, you know, it was imbued in me at a very, very young age. So it wasn't surprising that uh, I wanted to go into military service. And so I went to the Naval Academy. Um, and uh, it, was, it was an interesting journey uh, because I, I actually thought I was going to go to West Point. Okay. And, uh, All right. You know, so I think a lot of people may or may not know the competitive nature between the Naval Academy and West Point. <laughs> but uh, truly, uh, I, I was a recruited lacrosse player. Okay. And um, had the opportunity to get recruited by both institutions. And, um, and I really think the, one of the primary reasons I went to the Naval Academy was the time of year I visited both institutions. Okay. So uh, if you've ever been in upstate New York, uh, you know, at the end of January, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's really not an inviting place. So it was kind of cold, kind of gray. And I was like, ooh, all right. I'm not sure that this is a place for me. And then a couple uh -huh. of months go by and I go down to the, and you're familiar with this, you know, I went down to Annapolis, Maryland, uh, uh -huh. you know, in April, uh, nice sunshiny days. Yeah. Gorgeous time oh, of year. Wow. This place is amazing. Sitting on the water, seeing all that stuff, <laughs> you know, not having any idea of what, you know, the Naval Academy experience was all about. But, uh, so yeah, I think this is a place for me. Right. And, uh, so I had a, a lot of, uh, you know, mentors that, that helped me get to where I wanted to go to include, you know, athletic coaches, uh, my parents, uh, relatives. You know, I didn't even know that the Naval Academy existed uh, until I had, uh, you know, an aunt who went to college in Maryland say, hey, how come you're not, he, you're only talking about West Point. You're not talking about the Naval Academy. And I'm like, <laughs> huh? And yeah. uh, so I started looking, looking at that, and uh, lo and behold, I ended up there. And okay. uh, so went through the academy, and then I was a career uh, surface warfare officer. And uh, what that means to, to the average person, is I spent a lot of time on ships, uh, spent a lot of time at sea, and uh, got to do a lot of neat stuff from you know, small unit or small team leadership um, to – you know, large uh, planning and operational tours. Uh, one of the best tours I had uh, was going back to the Naval Academy and okay. going back to the Naval Academy as a leadership development instructor. And uh, so I like to say I, I, I taught leadership uh, in the morning and I coached rugby in the afternoons. So, you, you know, on the banks of the Severn River. So Yeah, how about that? Can't really get much better than that. And, yeah. um, now and what? then I I'm sorry to stop you. And even thinking through a few things that you said already, um, obviously it, it sounds that sports played a huge role in um, just what you were doing, that, that maybe that team aspect that comes into play. What, what was it innately, even as you know, a, a child even, that, um, that you draw upon, reflect upon even now that, that sports provided for you, the, the benefit that that was? Sure. Uh, sports were part of my, you know, upbringing, um, mm -hmm. whether it was playing, you know, football in the fall. Uh, initially, uh, I, would, I played baseball as a kid okay. uh, and then eventually picked up a lacrosse stick. Uh, and uh, on Long Island, you literally had to make a decision. You know, are you oh, a okay. baseballer? Are you a lacrosse lacrosse guy or gal? Uh -huh. and, uh, and once you made that decision, you, you really had to stick with it. And, uh, but it's really the life lessons that, that mm -hmm. team sports or, or sports in general teach you. Um, uh, because, you know, in life, if you want to win, you got to put in the hard work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but just as important is you got to realize that there's people out there willing to support you and back you up. Yeah. You're okay with committing to a mission that involves other people 
and this mission of life that we're talking about, Stephen, mm-hmm. you can't you can't do it yourself. And just like you can't win a football game or a lacrosse game or a rugby match by yourself, uh, you can't win life by yourself either. Yeah. Well, I I think uh, what a lot of folks wrestle with in through sports is what does it mean to lose and and how do I draw upon those losses? And not, I'm not just talking necessarily about the, the scoreboard in the game. I can even think back to times in sports and on the practice field and whether a coach gets down on you or a teammate gets down on you and learning what it means when you let people down because you didn't fulfill your role in that moment. And that's that's hard as a teenager and let alone as an adult now in careers. And so I, I, I really believe in the team sport aspect and, you know, that, that sounds like it, it paved a, a, a place for you to, to be at the Naval Academy and even going back and maybe it was a, an element of self-care even as a, as a coach, you know, going back. Yeah. And I, I, well, I don't it, want to put it too broad of a stroke and assume too much for you, but th- those are things that I'm hearing and themes that, you know, uh, I'm already pulling out in the conversation. Well, the, uh, it's interesting because I, I, I wrote a LinkedIn article about that very thing uh, as I reflect on where we are, you know, as a nation, as a world. And uh, there's, there's two words that stick with me from my time playing rugby at the Naval Academy. And those two words are with you. Mm-hmm. And those are the words that you hear from a teammate when you're going to go into contact. Mm-hmm. An opposing player. And you know when you hear those words because of the camaraderie and the commitment and dedication to each other, that even though you are literally going to go into physical contact, you know, you're going to have an impactful moment with another human uh, that is likely going to hurt you and, and him, that there's this feeling of safety because you mm-hmm. know that you have a teammate going into that contact with you and yeah. sharing that and sharing that adversity. So no matter how painful it's going to be, you know that you, somebody has your back. And when you know somebody has your back to your point earlier, mm-hmm. we can endure anything. Yeah. Yeah, man, that's good. That's good. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, and you'll get there and how that carries over. Um, you're at the Naval Academy, you're, you're, you're living the good life of, of work and, you know, teaching these young men uh, a, a sport. Uh, where, where did it go from there? So it was interesting because I never planned to make the military a career. Okay. Uh, I planned to do my you know, mandatory service obligation and then go into law enforcement and um, didn't really think much about it because there's a lot of Naval Academy graduates who went into federal law enforcement. You know, my family had a history of law enforcement or, you know, service in, in the fire service. So it was something that I knew I was going to do, but uh, when it was time for me to do it, it wasn't an option. Uh, So (laughs) I didn't, I didn't put much thought into what I wanted to do. Uh, And uh, then, you know, what I didn't put a lot of thought into wasn't even possible. So I spent uh, not a whole lot of time thinking about it. And then the Navy actually made it easy. Uh, They asked me, hey, what do you think about getting a graduate degree? Uh, What do you think about extending on shore duty in Annapolis uh, for a year? And what if we give you a bonus on top of all of that? And I'm like, well, that was easy. (laughs) Um, you know, so the only effort for me was to sign a piece of paper that said, yeah, I'll let you do all those things for me. Yeah. And, uh, and then September 11th happened Mm -hmm. and uh, something that changed my life, uh, changed the life of, of thousands and thousands of people, uh, in even, you know, the direction of our country. Right. And, uh, so I, I accidentally transitioned into a, a naval career and, um, you know, had some department head tours, as we call it, so kind of mid-level uh, stuff. I was uh, I was on a guided missile cruiser, and I uh, was a weapons officer and a combat systems officer. Uh, during that time, I, I deployed down to the Caribbean 
uh, which sounds interesting. Uh, we did uh, six months of uh, Carter Narcotics. Okay. Uh, interdiction and uh, and then uh, then deployed to the Persian Gulf and uh, did uh, uh, anti-air defense and uh, carrier uh, carrier escort duty for the um, for the enterprise uh, strike group and uh, after that I went to the uh, Naval War College and uh, got another graduate degree uh, in, in national security and strategic studies and then uh, went to Afghanistan and I like to say uh, it was a Navy appreciation tour for me because I, okay. I served with the Army for a year as an operational planner. Okay. And I uh, got to see how the how things worked on land uh, because I was a, thousands of miles from from the nearest ocean. Uh, so I was literally a fish out of water. But it was a it was an amazing experience to see what you know the Army does, the Marine Corps does, um, and our international partners. And while yeah. I was there, I. Um, uh, I was screened uh, for command, command at okay. sea. Uh, so I left left Afghanistan and uh, went uh, went to uh, be an executive officer uh, and ultimately a commanding officer on a guided missile frigate in Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. And uh, if if I could just pause you even for a minute, what what in those lead up years was was leadership like for you? like where you were a young officer, where you had a few of these assignments, what was happening there in terms of your experience? Did, were, you, were you doing well as a leader? Were you, were you fumbling through it? Were you, uh, did, was the Navy helpful in teaching you some critical things at that point before you took over command um, uh, of a ship yourself? What, what type of lessons were you learning along the way there? So, you know, you asked uh, about mentors mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I was, I was blessed to have um, share an office for at least briefly with uh, the distinguished leadership chair at the, at the Naval Academy when I was a leadership instructor. Okay. Just the life lessons and leadership lessons I took from him uh, were amazing. But then when I got to my, my department head tours, uh, I got reintroduced to, uh, you know, two mentors, uh, one who was a career uh, Navy guy who turned, um, you know, turned basically uh, a port engineer is what they're called. And they're kind of like the, the lifeblood or civilian lifeblood of a ship that okay. uh, looks at their maintenance. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had spent 30 years in the Navy before he did that. Wow. And uh, so the life lessons and leadership lessons that uh, he provided were amazing. And then I had another mentor. He was another port engineer. Uh, he just had a different track. He was, he was in the Merchant Marine for a little while. And, uh, you know, he was part-time surfer, uh, you know, part-time port engineer. So right. completely different, uh, you know, different perspective, but it was amazing. And uh, the leadership lessons I took from them, as well as you know, some of my commanding officers and, uh, and others, um, were helpful. And I, and I was doing well. Uh, yeah. I was doing really well. You know, I, uh, the, um, I was, uh, I got a, it was a peer nominated leadership award. Um, and then I even got an operational leadership award. Uh, from the Surface Navy Association, it was an Arleigh Burke uh, you know, Surface Navy Association award, and uh, you know, it's it. You actually get your name inscribed on the uh, on the Navy Memorial in Washington D.C. So, wow! Yeah, that's an honor. Yeah. So it was an interesting interesting experience uh, up up to that point. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then getting, getting, uh, you know, screened for, for command, uh, particularly when you never even planned to make the military career, yeah. uh, but absolutely puts you in a pretty select group of, uh, of individuals. Highly What's that process like? Uh, so basically they, they take your record, they mm -hmm. look at your record, they look at, you know, what you've done. Uh, there are certain things, certain wickets that you have to, you know, meet in terms of 
schooling experience and you know you need to be ranked uh you know high amongst your peers to even be considered okay yeah that that's the the it's interesting when we think about our own leadership and we think about even benchmarks and things that we're meeting uh, expectations of our supervisors but when it comes down to actually your peers and a lot of times I think they have a better pulse on your integrity and your capabilities and your different capacities in a completely different light. Uh, and, and a lot of times that's extremely uh, humbling to think about, especially when you start having conversations with your peers about how you're actually doing, not necessarily what you're just projecting out there. Yeah. And in my, in my current role, it's interesting that you you talk about that because I'm a big, uh, you know, from a leadership development and, and coaching space, I'm a huge advocate of whether it's qualitative or quantitative 360 assessments. So you can truly, because it's one thing in terms of how we think we're doing, but mm-hmm. also getting that perspective from others. Right. So we can really, you know, focus on, okay, you know what, that's, I really thought I was doing well there. Uh, but maybe I'm not, <laughs> and uh, I need to pay a little bit of attention to that. Yeah, no, and and just understanding how you're you're treating people and and how your attitude is is perceived because how you think it's going and how your 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 peers and people you're leading think it's going can be complete polar opposites at times, and and that can be a difficult pill to swallow, especially if if objectives aren't being met uh, for for what you set out to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you get three, uh, three opportunities to get, uh, to get screened for command. And, uh, I didn't, I didn't get picked up on my, on my first look okay. and, uh, it wasn't, and that's one of the reasons I decided to, to go to Afghanistan as, as an operational, uh, planner was to show the organization, uh, my commitment, uh, mm-hmm. To, to the process and, and to the system. Yeah. What was your attitude like when you didn't get through that first time? Uh, I honestly, I was confused because uh, okay. I, I, I looked at my record. I, I looked at, you know, where I'd been and what I'd done. And uh, I, I thought it met the bar and exceeded the bar for, for those going to command. Um, but also realized that, you know what, there's, there are things outside of my control yeah. um, that you just have to be okay with. Mm-hmm. And uh, the only thing, you know, I, uh, I'm a, was it a hard pill to swallow? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, when you, uh, when you, you know, when you know that you're doing the right thing and, and you're meeting all the wickets and you're, you know, meeting all the, I like to say, you know, you're, you're hitting all the checkpoints and then, you're like, oh, what do you mean? I didn't get selected. Yeah. Uh, so absolutely a hard pill to swallow. But you know, when you take the time to reflect on it, you're like, well, you know what? I could focus on my behavior. I could focus on my attitude. I could focus on my actions and my effort. Mm-hmm. And then we'll see what happens. Right. And that's what I did. Yeah. No, not being, not being overcome by that, you know, disappointment in that moment. And it's, it, it, folks have to understand that those, you know, uh, difficult times don't necessarily reflect on their ability to do the job. It's for a number of reasons that, you know, it didn't pan out. And I mean, that's a crossroad. People can, you know, throw up their hands and walk away and do something else, or they can, you know, dig deeper and grind harder and, you know, exert more discipline to achieve that if that's really an outcome they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. So what, what at that point, uh, Going through a process, I, I take it you went back through that process uh, at, at a time to uh, actually go on to, to command a ship. Yeah, so I, I got screened and uh, I got picked up for for command. And the way it uh, works in the in the surface navy, or at least the majority of the surface navy, is um, you go to command school up in Newport, Rhode Island. And then uh, you serve as an executive officer, so the second in command for about a year and a half. And then, uh, you know, as long as the, the, the commanding officer as well as the commodore 
who is uh, that that individual who's in charge of a group of ships gives you the thumbs up that you know what he is the guy or gal that we want to to be in command right then uh, then then you, you go and do it and uh, you know I was I was you know absolutely blessed with uh, you know a commanding officer who who allowed me to to grow and, and develop as as an officer as an executive officer and you know as a soon to be commanding officer as well as uh, you know commodores who who cared about my personal and professional development yeah yeah no that's important to have those those leaders supervisors people in in charge that actually uh, want to uh, hopefully make you be better than they were <laughs> right yeah. and that takes a level of humility. Well, yeah, to, to your point, you know, when you reflect on your career, you know, you take a look at the, the people that were under your charge, whether they were enlisted sailors or junior officers, and see where they went, see where they ended up. Yeah. Um, and you want them to get to where you, you got or even further. Right. Showing that you had, you know, some sort of positive impact on their lives, their careers and everything else. Do you think that's an important thing for maybe on the military side for you to reflect upon and look as you're leading maybe junior officers, people under you that are in a supervisory role to, to look at how their subordinates are growing and that, that that should be definitely something you take into consideration as you think about uh, moving maybe that junior officer into more leadership role or maybe needing to stop and uh, kind of reevaluate where they're out and help guide them into, hey, how are your people doing? Are, are they becoming more capable uh, in their job or maybe even in their personal life? Right. Uh, is, is that applicable in the military? Absolutely. Uh, but is that implic- you know, applicable in any organization? Absolutely. Yeah. If, um, you know, I, I believe, in, and it's a nautical phrase, but uh, I, I believe that a rising tide raises all boats. Mm. And, um, you know, if, if somebody's only paying attention to themselves and uh, they're not looking f- to develop others, then I... I think it's a loss to the organization. Um, The, uh, the uh, Adam, Adam Grant's book, give and take uh, was, was it absolutely impactful to me uh, because spending time thinking about how can I lift others up to make the entire organization better? Mm-hmm. rather than just to take from others or take from the organization to make me better okay. um, is, is absolutely one of the ways that I've, I looked at my career, but also looked, look at my life. You know, how do you, how do you make sure that you're doing the things to make the people around you, the best versions of themselves? Yeah. Right on. Right on. So keep keep going with your your story. Sure. Uh, wh- yeah. Where where you're at now? Yeah, I think yeah. I, I think I know where you want me to go. Uh, so uh, yeah, as a commanding officer, uh, had had an interesting time in command. Um, really, you know, it was, it was successful. Um, meeting all the operational wickets that I needed to meet, and um, we actually got. Uh, selected to do a national tasking mission uh, in support of the 2014 uh, Sochi Winter Olympics. Okay. And uh, we were off the coast of, uh, of uh, Sochi uh, in support of the Olympics. And, um, you know, I like to say we were, we were close enough that we could see the Olympic torch uh, in the foreground of the, uh, the Sochi mountains Wow. And uh, close enough that uh, we had a lot of uh, interested, uh, you know, Russian maritime security assets uh, interested in in why we were there <laughs> and everything else, as, as right. you rightly imagine. Yeah. And then um, uh, we had to check off station to go get gas and groceries, as we like to say. Uh, so we sailed across the, uh, the Black Sea uh, to a place called Samson, Turkey. And... Um, we uh, we were pulling into port, 
really nice day out uh, and uh, things were absolutely moving in the right direction until they weren't. And uh, we were, we were about 50 yards right of our proposed uh, track into the Harbor and ended up running aground. Um, mm. And for those who aren't in, in the nautical space, running aground is when, you know, your propeller or the hull of your ship actually hits the bottom. Mm. And uh, for me, it was my propeller blades. Um, so much so that I actually damaged three of them. And uh, we ended up being non-mission capable after that. So during a time of heightened uh, tensions in, in the Black Sea, uh, I was in the worst possible place uh, that you know, a military officer can be non-mission capable. So when you rewind the clock a little bit, you know, you're off the coast of Sochi, Russia, and uh, you're providing, you know, you're doing a national tasking mission. And what you're doing is getting briefed to the highest levels of the American civilian and military infrastructure. So mm -hmm. for, for a ship captain, you know, that, that's where you want to be. You know, that's yeah. the, uh, you know, the ultimate place of, of responsibility and accountability. And then within a 24 hour period, you go from being on the highest, highest, you know, peak to being in the loneliest valley that you could, could be in. And about, you know, they did a pretty brief investigation and um, figured out that there was absolutely, you know, some, some things that could have gone better, obviously. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I was, I was relieved of command. And uh, so that was a pretty, uh, pretty impactful uh, experience. Yeah, absolutely. What when when the ship runs aground? I mean, was was that something that I mean, where were you when it happened? What what were some of the like, what were the steps that you take when that happens in that moment in terms of uh, getting resources to where they need to be, getting information? Because I, you know there were a lot of people under your charge at that point, I imagine. Sure. And there's a lot of moving parts to a, a, a ship moving. Uh, right. And so what, what were some of the inner workings going on in that moment? So where was I? I was on the starboard bridge wing. Uh, and for those that are not <laughs> uh, <laughs> familiar with that, that's the right side. And uh, the, uh, and I was with the Harbor pilot. Okay. I was actually with the guy that knew the harbor better than anyone else. Uh, obviously, he didn't. Uh, <laughs> but you know what? Not his fault. Um, my fault. And uh, so what do you do? You figure out where you were. Uh, we actually called in some tugs to, to, to get us out uh, to where we needed to go. Um, had all the controlling stations uh, figure out if we had any damage. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all the reports that I got were, no, not too much. You know, if we have any damage, we don't know about it. Okay. And um, so we then proceeded back into the harbor and pulled, pulled in pier side. Uh, and that's when I found out that, you know what, we actually had some damage. Okay. And um, so, you know, it is what it is. And uh, what I, what I wasn't prepared for really was the aftermath of that event, uh, both from a personal perspective and a professional perspective, because um, you know, when you have a mishap, there's obviously um, investigations that happen, and then the military has its own uh, you know, judicial process that they, that they put you through, and, and rightly so. And um, so that, that was really a almost a two year, uh, ordeal that, that I ended up going through. Wow. Now at that time, did, what, what, what was it like? We t had the conversation about our peers, what um, amongst your peers, other officers and things, d did you get a mix of, of support and condemnation or did, what was that like, um, being, having that position at that time and then, uh, you know, fellow officers, what, what, what did they think and how did you navigate those conversations? Cause I'm sure 
I'm assuming people were calling and wanting to know one how you're doing, what what's going on, uh, what does the future hold, and uh, I mean, did you have to deal with some tough conversations even amongst friends with that? Absolutely. The um, but to your point, Stephen, I would also say that uh, you you also learn pretty quickly who your true friends are. Uh, I can imagine that um, because your true friends are the ones who actually did call, um, and you you figured out that. Uh, the folks that never called again <laughs> uh, from from then until now, yeah, um, that it was a relationship that really wasn't based on on trust or anything else. But um, yeah, that was. I, I still remember getting an email from from a mentor, um, and it it actually didn't even say anything. Uh, it was the subject line was, it's not the critic who counts. And uh, if, if you don't know where that comes from, it comes from Theodore Roosevelt's um, citizenship in the Republic speech uh, that he gave in 1910 in France. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was something in his part, and part of that speech is called the man in the arena. And Mm -hmm. that was something that we learned as midshipmen. Um, You know, it's not the critic who count. It's, it's the man in the arena who's actually doing the deeds, you know? And um, so that actually put me in the right mindset. Okay. It's a simple email that said nothing but those few words. And, uh, but I always had the support of, of my family. I always had the support of, of close friends. Um, and you know what? I had the support of, of, of mentors because good, bad, or indifferent, and everybody could have a bad day. And you, you have to accept that. Yeah. And you can't let it define you. Because if you let it define you, then you know what? Then that could spiral into a lot of other things that you probably don't want to deal with. Yeah, 100%. Well, Going through that experience, uh, I mean, did you get out of the military right after that when the investigation was through? How how did you start to transition at that point and start to draw upon these experiences to lead into to even what you're doing today? So after, after I was relieved of command, I went to a, a staff job, as we like to call it. And uh, ultimately, I was the director of uh, future operations for Naval Forces Southern Command. Okay. Uh, which uh, is the naval component to U.S. Southern Command and is responsible for uh, maritime acti- naval and maritime activities in Central and South America. And uh, so I did that for about, I would say it was about 18 to 24 months, and then I retired. And um, you know, during that time, again, I had some, some mentors who I'm still in, in close contact with now uh, that – helped that transition. And I like to say it, it was a forced transition because once you're, once you're relieved of command, you're never going to have the ability to command again. Mm-hmm. So I, I had the ability to stay in the Navy um, for another eight, eight years if I wanted to, uh, but I wasn't going to be able to command again. Right. So once you're in command, that's all you want to do because of the, the way you're able to positively impact other people. And uh, knowing that I couldn't do that again, uh, I wanted to do something else. And uh, the nice thing is my, my wife is in the, in the corporate space and she had uh, you know, some command opportunities in, in corporate America uh, that we wanted to take advantage of too. So uh, okay. It was, it was kind of a dual path kind of thing. Uh, give her the opportunity to do what, what I wanted to do uh, and support her in, in that adventure uh, as well as do something that allowed me to still impact other people based on my experiences. Yeah, right on, right on. Well, if, if you would help us maybe transition a moment in this conversation to 
getting a little more practical for our audience and sure i I mean i said in the beginning i believe those experiences cause us to be able to combine with our education to lead us into helping people and understanding our own uh space and so if could you shine a little bit of light maybe from your perspective on the the personal experience wherever uh, listeners are at and what they're doing what are some things and key takeaways that you learned from your life and even the the space you uh, exist in now in terms of how do we build a team and how do we become more resilient? Because, I mean, you didn't wake up that day knowing that uh, a ship was going to run aground, but you had to address it. You had to address it. And, and there's there's really only two ways in my mind that you can go you can you know positively move on from that and address what needs to be addressed or you can just uh completely go into that depressing mindset and and slowly um uh get to a place that is not productive for anybody it's not even healthy it's uh, right. has a lot of, and and then we can go down a whole nother path as well so what are the things that you learn and that you uh, are, are are putting out there to to help people and in, in building a team and i know we had some in our lead-up conversation i love what you were sharing about you know building our tribe and and some things that we can practically apply in our lives Sure. Um, some of the big takeaways uh, during during that two year period uh, when I was uh, uh, on that staff job, I uh, I ended up getting into triathlon. Okay. And uh, the interesting thing about the sport of triathloning is you know three events, you know the swim, the bike, the run. But guess what? There's two transitions <laughs> in in that right. So you have to figure out okay. What am I good at? What am I okay at? And what am I not good at? And it provides a lot of opportunity for self-reflection. So I think the, the, the key thing is, and you hear it very often, well, what's your passion? What's your purpose? Yeah. Well, you know, that's a pretty big thing to try and figure out. But if you break it down into its component pieces, what are my strengths? What am I good at? What energizes me? You know, what's the work that I do that I'd lose track of time? And then what are the problems that I want to solve? Yeah, so that's good. Reflecting on your strengths, reflecting on what energizes you, and reflecting on the problems that you want to solve is a start. The next is your values. You know, what are your values, your personal values? Mm-hmm. Uh, because very often we end up in organizations that provide us with our values. And my values from the time I was 18 years old until the time I was 42 was honor, courage, and commitment. And that is absolute and great values. Absolutely great values. And, and they guide a professional career. Mm-hmm. But what do you want to guide your career and your life? And uh, for me, it's autonomy, impact, and security. Autonomy in terms of making, making or having the ability to do what I want to do with the people I want to do it with, whether that's personally or professionally. Impact, being able to enlighten, empower, and equip others to do what they want to do, both on an individual team and community level. And then security having the physical emotion or yeah, having the physical, emotional and, and financial safety for me and the people who matter to me. So yeah. that way we can make decisions about how we want to impact the lives of other people. Mm-hmm. And that's how I make decisions. And then, you know, the other one is priorities. What do you want to prioritize for you? But all of that, you know, that's all great stuff to say, Stephen, but it takes time. It takes dedicated, focused time with yourself. Um, Because you have to ask yourself those questions before you can ask others the same questions about you. So taking the time to think about it is is the first thing that uh, I recommend to to the people that I coach. And uh, in terms of resilience, 
you know, I, I define resilience and I'd be interested to know your definition as, you know, our ability to lean into adversity and come out of it in a positive and productive way. Mm-hmm. And to do that, I think there's four components of it. And, and you had mentioned one already, but it's, it's, it's your mind in terms of your mental health and, and mindfulness. It's your body in terms of physical wellness. It's your tribe. And then it's your why. And we talked about why in terms of, you know, what are your strengths? What are you energized by? And, you know, what are the problems that you want to solve? And making that part of your daily routine is, or at the very least, your weekly routine is a key to, to living a resilient life. You're taking care of your mind, taking care of your body, developing and, and, and taking care of your tribe as well as pursuing something that you know is going to make your life worthwhile Mm -hmm. is what is going to allow you to live that resilient life. Yeah, absolutely. And the the only thing that I I would add to that, I agree. Uh, I I think we align pretty well in what we're talking about is the speed in which you can respond to those things. And so when we're we're trying to gain more knowledge, maybe it's from going to a conference or reading a book or sitting down with a counselor or a mentor or someone, we need to acquire that knowledge that uh, allows us in the moment that maybe we're um, not going through a trial or going through a struggle or going through a challenge, if we can acquire the skills and abilities that allow us to, when we face adversity, to be able to reach in and maybe uh, fix our attitude or reach out to someone or use networking or having those mentors allows us, we know what to do, right? So we are, we are prepared for that moment. We don't have to learn how to get through that moment. Um, and the faster we can bounce back from that struggle is going to help recalibrate us, reset us on that course that's going to start moving forward. And so taking in all the you know wonderful things and perfect things that you said is if we are doing all those things, we are able to um, get back on the horse a lot faster. And you know that's why we always say children are so resilient because they truly are. You know you can get down on them or they can experience a failure, and in an hour it's like you you have this completely different child that's back driving on and they can experience. So at the speed in which you can move beyond those things, I think is, is the ultimate goal. And, and we're all come into this world with different levels of, uh, um, uh, resiliency that's built into our DNA. But I, I, I don't want to fall short and be naive to think that we can't build resiliency through things that we go out and do. Uh, you're a hundred percent correct. And I think what, what you described is at least for me, a common miscon- misconception, right? Very often people look at resiliency as perseverance. You know, my, mm. my ability to continue running up those stadium steps up and down and up and down, and up and down. And you know what, that's how big your battery is. Resiliency is how long does it take you to recharge it? Yeah, there you go. And, you know, recharging it is the important part. Um, it's awesome to have a huge battery. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, um, but who, who do you want on your team? Right. That, that guy or gal that has an enormous battery, but once it's empty, it's empty and it takes months to recharge. Yeah. Or that person that has, you know, an average size battery, but you know what? it is recharged all the time and they're ready to go all the time. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great analogy and and way to look at it because um, you can even think of it in terms of, and maybe you could speak this more, even in in personality, when we think about um, character traits of being an introvert or extrovert, and the amount of time it takes maybe an introvert to, to recharge and to become capable again. And I think, uh, 
uh, you know, maybe they are at a, a big engagement with a lot of people and then, you know, it, it takes them two days to be wanting to step back into that type of arena and equipping them with maybe strategies and tools to think through those experiences to say, yeah, you're always going to remain an introvert, but here are the things you can do to set yourself up to, to re-engage. Or an extrovert, maybe you need to stop them and, and say, hey, maybe we need to take a moment and take a breath and reflect on what just happened and not just charge back in, you sure. know, just, just as an illustration. Um, no, and, and it, it it's a great point, Stephen, because uh, I am a classic introvert. And, um, you know, my training as an executive coach and as a consultant uh, has provided the opportunity to, to look at that in terms of, you know, what do I do to, to recharge? Because, when I, I do need some time to reflect. I do need some time to recharge. But it goes back to, well, what do I do for my, my mindfulness? Right? What am I doing to make sure that I'm on, in the right headspace? Mm-hmm. And sometimes that is, in fact, with, with a headspace app or an insight timer <laughs> app um, to actually get into that space. Mm-hmm. I know that you know, I'm a I'm a Peloton guy, right? So I know that one of the best ways for me to get that, I like to call it the emotional and mental strength back, is to work out. Um, I have a Naval Academy classmate of mine. I I love his quote, you know, um, positive motion in terms of exercise and fitness creates positive emotion. And um, yeah, absolutely agree with it and ascribe to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other part is who are those people in terms of your, your tribe who energize you when you're, when you know that you need to be recharged, mm-hmm. who can you call up on the phone and say, Hey, Steven, you know what? I just had a burner of a week, man. I could just <laughs> really <laughs> like to connect and, you know, have a chat and, and do it, make it yeah. part of your routine. So that way, you know, your battery level, your energy level is not going all over the place. It actually is staying at, at a level that makes sense for you. Yeah. What are the considerations in, in intentionally building a tribe? We obviously have maybe, uh, you know, our family or our workspace and our, our coworkers and different people that we are constantly around. But when, when it comes down to actually intentionally building those people that are around us and support us and um, how do we build a tribe? And maybe to that point, how do we maybe let go of someone and say, I need to maybe not have them part of my tribe. And, and maybe this is a point you can even get into a little deeper. I, I, I loved what we talked about in our lead up conversation about the, the, the quick reaction force, the, the QRF the, sure. that's part of that. Well, I, I think there's two parts uh, to your tribe uh, and the QRF is one. And for those that uh, don't know what a QRF is, it's a quick reaction force that uh, the military and law enforcement use uh, and you know, they respond to situations. Um, and as a s- career surface warfare officer, we had two different types of QRFs on ships. One was for firefighting and then one was for anti-terrorism and force protection. And uh, in terms of how do you look at that from a life perspective, it's who are those people that you could call 24 hours a day, seven days a week for insight perspective and or accountability. Mm-hmm. You know what? This this is what I've got going on. I just need some perspective. And whether that's Friday night at 11 p.m. or that's on Tuesday morning at, at 7.15, having five to 10 people in your life where you can actually make that phone call to, whether it's family, friends, or whomever, mm-hmm. I think is absolutely paramount. And um, so, so that's step one. And the next step is your tribe. And uh, from both a personal and pro- uh, professional perspective, and it goes to perspective, it goes to insight, it goes to accountability, absolutely, because your QRF is part of your tribe. But also, who are those mentors that are doing what you want to do? Mm-hmm. 
the way you want to do it and identifying who they are and reaching out to them and, and being able to do that on a regular basis, who are your, who are the trust, your trusted colleagues who are in the space that you're in, who are doing things the way you want to do them? Mm -hmm. Who are the thought leaders in, in the area that, that makes sense for you? And then the other part is who are those people that you trust, but have an absolutely different perspective than you do and can provide you with different thoughts, different ideas that you never ever consider because that's just not how you think. Yeah. And having all of those people, and being able to connect with them on a regular basis, you know, make that part of your routine, I think is super. So you're looking for intellect, you're looking for wisdom, you're looking for thought partners and, and everything that goes with it. Does that answer your question, Steve? Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's great. That's fantastic for people to be able to, to think about. And I hope... In, in the age and maybe even during this this COVID experience, I think there's been uh, a lot of people because of media having to connect over media. And, you know, I, I know for me and my family and just some of the conversations we've had with folks and it, there's there you don't have that uh in-person dynamic of kind of playing off other people with maybe body language and things like that, that you'd experience in a one-on-one -on -one or a group setting uh, where you're having to be very intentional with your, your questioning and your speech. And I think the, the precision in which we have to learn to communicate over technology actually is a benefit to us that helps us um, step into those conversations and maybe have those a little bit more difficult conversations. I share with you, I, I look forward to every week we have the interrupted man group and, and we get together and for 45 minutes early in one morning each week, we just connect, maybe ask a tough question, yeah. talk a little bit. And, and man, that that's recharging. Talk about, you know, getting ready for your day. That was yesterday morning. It's like, man, right after that, I went for a run, get to work. It's like, you're ready to attack a day. And so it's amazing what other people are able to do for, for you. And you hope you're reciprocating that as well uh, for yep. them in, in those conversations and engagement. I know you're involved in, in mastermind groups as well. Um, so um, what I, I want you, before we close, to definitely talk about um, what you're doing now and, and ways that you can help people and how people can connect with you. But before we do that, what, what did, what did we uh, miss? And by saying that we talked about a lot in, in a very short amount of time. And so I know we missed a lot, but what is something that, that you really want to share if you haven't already? Is there, there's something that you, that's going on in your mind that's like, Hey, Steve, I, I want to say this to the interrupted movement. Is there anything that, that we missed? I don't know that we missed it, but it's, it's something that I, I really want to emphasize. And it's life is going to present you with challenges. Life is going to present you with obstacles. Life is going to pre present adversity. And so that's a fact. That is absolutely a fact of life. What you do with that, those challenges, what you do with that adversity, what you do with those obstacles is a choice. And it's up to you to decide what, what you want to do, how you want to do it, and who you do it with. Mm -hmm. And I think the key component is realizing that you don't have to do it alone, that there's people out there in your life that are ready and willing to support you in this thing that we call life. And um, in terms of what I do now, you know, as a leadership development uh, consultant and uh, performance and transition coach, the areas that uh, I, I like to focus on are emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, resilience, <laughs> which we talked a lot about, uh, yeah. both at uh, an individual and organizational level, uh, team effectiveness, and and decision making. Yeah. And uh, right now, I, I spend time at the individual level as well as team level. And uh, in terms of getting in touch with me, uh, uh, the quickest way to get in touch with me is, is on LinkedIn and okay. uh, you know, sending me a note there. 
Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be linking everything up uh, through the podcast uh, that when people listen to this, they'll be able to connect with you uh, in, in what you're doing. And uh, what's next? What, what are you looking towards? What's your trajectory uh, now? Well, what's next is I'm actually writing a book about transitioning on purpose. Uh, right on. You know, we've talked about you know, transitioning on accident for me in terms of being a <laughs> career officer, military officer. You know, I, I had a forced transition, and now I'm in the you know purposeful transition space in terms of knowing who knowing who you are, knowing what matters, and making intentional and deliberate uh, decisions to allow you to live your best life. And uh, so where am, where am I going? Uh, I'm looking to expand you know, my, my coaching practice to, to help people get to where they want to go. Right on, man. That's, that's all an incredibly exciting stuff, man. I, I got to say, I, I appreciate, you know, you taking the time to come on and, and talk to our audience today. And uh, this has been extremely beneficial for me. I got a list of notes down here that I already uh, will definitely be uh, thinking through uh, in the in these next few days and weeks. And, um, man, I, I, I wish you all the best luck. I just want to encourage you in, in the moment that, man, what you're doing is awesome. I thank you for what you're doing for so many people, not just on the, on the corporate side, but uh, individually, because even as you're trying to make better leaders out of, uh, uh, of different folks, um, you're you're helping them. I'm sure in their family uh, have have better relationships, be able to connect to people more deeply, and and we need people committed to that mission as well. Uh, I, I I appreciate um, you being willing to to stand on the front lines of of that fight, and uh, just for uh, the many things that you accomplish, even in in your military career, uh, it, it's it's really cool to hear that story, and I hope it inspires others uh, to drive hard at, at what they want to achieve and even though things are very uncomfortable at times that they're really willing, willing to press on and press through those things no and, and Stephen, i i truly appreciate the opportunity to, to talk and uh you know to get your thanks uh from a guy who's starting a movement of his own uh is is pretty impressive and uh, i appreciate what you're doing and I look forward to staying connected and to, to help the interrupted movement get to where it wants to go. Hey, right on. And uh, we, lo- we look forward to that book coming out, man. You just have to stay in touch with us and, yep. and we'll get that message out to the audience as well. So, man, I, I, I greatly appreciate the time you took today, man. Absolutely, brother. And uh, I'll be in touch. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, take care. And there you have it. There was my conversation with Dennis. I hope you enjoyed it and had some information that maybe you can take away and maybe apply uh, immediately to your life and uh, different situations you find yourself in. I encourage you definitely look up uh, Dennis and the the things that he's involved in. You can check out the show notes where I have his LinkedIn information on there and he's written some cool articles and is just doing a lot in the space and I'm looking forward to all the things that are going to be coming uh, down the pike here from Dennis and we've already been chatting and talking about uh, next time we'll be able to have him on the podcast and, and do some some things in the future that I'm really excited about. So with that, thank you for tuning into the show. Please remember to like, share, and subscribe with as many people as you can to continue to get the word out. And I appreciate you allowing me to interrupt your day. Thank you for listening to The Interrupted Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash The Interrupted Podcast and on Instagram at The Interrupted underscore podcast. Be sure to subscribe and leave a rating and review in order for us to continue to spread the word about preparing for and embracing life's interruptions.